so please welcome Stanley Crouch and James and Jimmy. Different things. I mean, and Clive Davis is a book about it. Clive Davis ran Columbia Records at the time of Miles Davis was there. Clive Davis claims in four pages of his book that Miles Davis' records were not selling what they thought they should sell. They made a lot of advances to him. He owed them a lot of money. And they told him he should change his direction. Now, they received a letter. They received a letter from his lawyer who was trying to get him out of the contract that he wanted to, he wanted to get out of the contract to Columbia. And Clive Davis says, uh, they said no. They wouldn't even change his music. And so one thing leads to another that he does. Now here's the most interesting part. As much as Miles Davis liked to talk about him and white people, and him in the industry, what he wasn't going to take him, what they weren't going to get him to do. There's no point in the record in which Miles Davis ever challenges anything that Clive Davis said about him in those four pages in his autobiography. But in Tuna, it's been quiet. And I've many times said, please, come out, talk, talk. And so you guys are here first. He's in many ways breaking a 30 year silence. So? Well, let me talk about that. Uh, Brother Lawrence was absolutely correct. As a matter of fact, when he first called me, I was like, no, man, that's cool. Uh, perhaps I come from the same persuasion. There's some stuff you don't need to comment on. Now, as Brother Crouch just said, a man who I do respect in many areas, this just happens to be one I don't. <laughs> I don't know why we sit up here talking about what Clive Davis wrote in the book, and because Miles didn't refute it, somehow that makes it correct. Now, y'all can sit in here when somebody wants to quote by another person saying it, or you do want to listen to me, who was there, who asked Miles from his mouth. But what I am sick and tired of is secondhand smoke screen. That's been going on for 30 years. All this stuff, people are more involved or more concerned with his posture and his wardrobe as opposed to his work. Now what I come to discuss is the art. Now there's a couple things we have to consider. Number one, there was an old phrase I wrote, I read a long time ago. It says, those who can do, those who can't teach, those that wish they could become critics. <laughs> now, let's start with this. The real argument here has nothing to do, I'm not dealing with his clothing, or what uh, Clive Davis said, or what George Bush said, none of that. What I'm dealing with is, let's discuss the man's work. Right. And if we're not here to discuss that, then let the conversation's over. This whole uh, 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 dichotomy really comes out of an old argument. And the old argument is acoustic music versus electronic. Let's be clear what this is about. Now, there are many people of the persuasion that acoustic music somehow has a more natural sound. Maybe I bumped my head, but I just want to know, tell me what's natural about a saxophone. What was natural about the 440 temper scale, as I quoted in this film? Music is as much involved with technology as everything else. For example, anyone who wants to be a writer, and I'm sure uh, 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 Stanley, like myself, started out with pencil and paper. Some point we evolved to probably an ink pen. Many of us, if you're old enough, had a typewriter. Now everybody uses a computer. That's called technology. Does that make one's writing any less valid because I'm doing it on a computer as opposed to longhand? That's called preference. Now why in everything else in life, technology we take for advantage? Matter of fact, we're talking to microphones. It's called electricity. If you want to really be, I can dig it if you're going to be consistent. Let's be consistent. Let's not use lights. When the sun goes down, that's it. <laughs> Let's not fly an airplane. Because if men and women were meant to fly, they'd have wings. Don't fly. It is so ridiculous. But how does it, when it gets to music, somebody plugs into a computer or somebody plugs into a synthesizer, and that's, that's the most horrific thing in the world. All art is a combination of art and technology. Now, if you want to be consistent, go back to a quill. <laughs> well, well. 
No, well, I, agree, I agree with you. I didn't think you were playing jazz. I mean, the, 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 the heaviest statement made in this film was what you said. You said we were not playing jazz, and I don't know why people got irritated about us doing what we were doing because it wasn't jazz. But, but the fact of the matter is that if it, if it, if that it is that Miles Davis considered, continued to be considered a jazz musician, and in his own book, which has his name on it, he refers to himself near the end as a jazz musician. Now, there, now at no point in his book does he say he wasn't a jazz musician. Now, who are we to believe? Do you think he thought he was a jazz musician or not? He says it in his book, but did somebody else write it? Miles said to me, as we discussed it many, many times, because in the book, well, the book that uh, uh, my Quincy. man, um, Quincy Truth, Quincy book, because it's, you know what, that's the other thing, there's so many books for Miles. I picked up a book the other day that was written by one of our roadies. <laughs> I, no, I swear to you, and, and, and he said that just before Miles died, he told me he wanted me to write this book. This is the guy that tuned up the guitars. But anyway, Miles' position and posture about what we were doing, now we're going to give you a series, about what we were trying to do was to create a fusion. A fusion of what we were calling seamless transition. And as a matter of fact, I bought a minute, maybe a little over a minute, of an example of that so I can show you all. I'll, I'll show it a little later in our discussion. The whole thing was to try to make this music sound and almost appear like it's unrehearsed. But it was a highly fine musical machine, what we were trying to do. And it was also trying to involve other elements. Basically what we had described it to ourselves when we talked was more like improvisational form. And it was to increase the boundaries. Now one of the things that I, I think that Miles came to grips with, it was a wonderful book written by Henry Pleasance, uh, who, who was a, a fine critic in, in terms of European classical music. And he was making a comment on European classical music, and one of the things he said, he made an observation that at some point it suffered from technical exhaustion, aesthetic decay, decay, I'm sorry, and social obsolescence. But the main emphasis, emphasis he was talking about is technical exhaustion. Now, what was he talking about? There's a certain point on any instrument that any and everything that's going to be played within the context and confines of that instrument has already been done. It's just like your growth. There's a certain point, we all grew to a certain point, that was it, we maxed. Unless we got some bone surgery and got a couple more inches. The same with instruments. What was going to be played on the sax, tenor sax, then, then all those cats that came before, all the greats, Train, uh, uh, I mean, look, uh, Coleman Hawkins, Sonny Rollins, all these great musicians. What else is going to be played on the piano? We go hear it. I still appreciate it, but it is not pushing the boundaries. And one of the conversations I did have with Miles, and we said this, if you're going to create new music, you must have access to new sounds and new colors. And that's what the electronics opened. My disappointment was other great musicians out of the jazz genre did not pursue it. Now, you didn't have to do it like Miles did. But there was another avenue. In other words, they had faced technical exhaustion. And the same tunes and stuff that cats were playing, that I, look, I could go hear the masters forever. It, look, Sonny Miles can play you know, his songs forever. Brown Eyed Girl, it doesn't matter. But in terms of the new crop, pushing the boundaries. See, genius is, is determined by the context of one's contribution within their generation. What did you do that was outstanding? And based on the limitation of the sounds, you can't produce genius. You can produce greatness, but not genius, because you can't contribute something new. Because now, first of all, electronics was not just started with miles. Some have been doing it way before that. It's a question of taking a different avenue, but it had reached technical exhaustion. Okay, Stanley, do you uh, agree with that notion? No. <laughs> no, I mean, no, no, as far as no, if if one is to to uh, reduce the artistic proposition to the pursuit of novelty, then he's right. But if but 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 the first thing is this: every one of us, the language we're using right now, has been used for hundreds of years in English. Now, according to him, if we follow his example of what he's saying, that all these words that we use, we should jump them and seek some other sounds so that we'll be able to come to come up to come up 
to the same level as, as our technology. The issue finally is always about human expression and whether or not somebody says something of value. Now the question about Miles Davis and Fusion, him, Weather Report, Herbie Hancock, and a number of, other, of those other people, is that as far as that music didn't really go anywhere, it basically disappeared. But I didn't say throw away the words we use in the dictionary. I didn't say hold that. Hold that. I, I just said that. Right. No, hold it, brother. Allow me the latitude of completion. Now, as I said, you said that you made some quirk about it. Novelty. No, I'm not saying throwing away all these words we've used for hundreds of years. Brother, I'm saying open up your mind to have new words to add to the vocabulary. I didn't say throw away the vocabulary. I said expand it. Like I'm sure, brother, 50 years ago, there was no word in a dictionary called internet. We expand as we grow. And that's all I'm saying. No one ever said throw away tradition. Brother, I listen to sketches in Spain like everybody else. I put on kind of blue, brother. It is like it was recorded yesterday. But to sit up here and you say what it didn't influence, and I'm telling you, the influence has been found in the next generation. See, sometimes people use this phrase, music has to wait. To, to find an audience, it has to skip a generation of listeners. What we had to wait for was a new generation of critics. I would remember time after time we would play, because at that time, let me tell you what Miles was, we were talking about. Let's give, let's say the, the situation that Clive Davis here, please let me do, you gotta change so you can make some money. Like Miles wasn't already rich. But anyway, the bottom line was, we would play a sold out concert Young people were starting to gravitate to that music. See, out of bitches brew came all those other broths. Weather Report, We Told You Forever, that came out of that. But he said, I'm telling you, we are losing young black people. That was his comment. He said, we, I want a fuse of music that will also draw them in. At that time, him and Hendrix were talking. Miles was never planning on, on playing with Hendrix. That was a misnomer people thought about. What Hendrix had asked him to do, because Hendrix was going to put a, a new band together called Electric Church. He wanted to start fusing some jazz musicians in his music. He asked Miles to help him with, with, the, uh, with, with putting the band together. But Miles was also dealing with Sly. See, for some reason, when you start to do contemporary music, it's almost like you reduce, well, if you're doing something popular, it, it, it's in some kind of way more trivial. The thing is, he wanted to reach that, and he wanted to bring young, young, more young black people in. And that's what started to happen when On the Corner came out. But the critics that were judging it, and I'm, look, in all seriousness, I'm really glad that you did say that was a problem. The critics were saying, jazz critics, what it was and what it wasn't. But there was a whole new generation. And that music influenced that. It, no, it's, uh, who's buying those records? That's not the issue. Expanding the boundaries of how you can be more creative with electronic. That's all we were trying to do, brother. Well, what has it evolved into at this point? First, what, do you, what do you see as happening? Oh, I saw it influence a lot of things. I saw it, uh, first of all, Santana, you know. No, I'm talking about you know, right now. Brother, 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 is Santa, does Santana exist now? Is he alive? You ask me a question. It's not about him being a great thinker. Santana is a great influence. He influenced a lot of young players. You know, most deaf. There's a lot of young people, Stanley, regardless of you, if you give them credit or not, I'm saying a generational influence. More of them know about Miles than they do about Monk, and that's a problem. But the bottom line is, he had left that. Why can't we get past that? He no longer wanted to wear the same clothes, he was no longer thinking the same way, and there was a lot more than just, just, he wanted to sell out and do commercial music. 